It's Tuesday, July 19th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, the nation's capital has more monkeypox cases per capita than any other state in the country. But what exactly is monkeypox and how dangerous is it? We get answers with an infectious diseases professor and doctor who actually treats patients right now at George Washington Hospital. The folks who are presenting themselves for testing and care are, again, the tip of the iceberg of who is actually infected with this virus. And in response to this outbreak, D.C. has launched a vaccine campaign to protect those most at risk. I actually talked to a D.C. resident about how and why he got his shot against the virus. I read a little bit about the symptoms of monkeypox and I was like, that's looking pretty gnarly. I don't think I want to get that. Thanks for joining us. I'm Luke Garrett. Megan is out today. We've been hearing about monkeypox in the news over the last few months, but the outbreak entered a new phase yesterday when Mayor Muriel Bowser launched an aggressive vaccination campaign. This move from the mayor comes after D.C. reported more monkeypox cases per capita than any other state in the country. To understand this virus, we turn to Dr. Tara Palamore, professor of infectious diseases at George Washington University. She's also a doctor that literally treats patients with this disease. So, doctor, thanks for being here. My pleasure. So just to start off, let's review really what this virus is before we get into anything else. So monkeypox is a milder relative of smallpox. Monkeypox has been circulating and causing outbreaks in Central and West Africa for decades. International public health authorities have been tracking those cases, but and occasional cases were found in non-endemic countries, such as England and the United States, brought by travelers. And actually, an outbreak occurred in the United States in 2003, traced to infected rodents imported from West Africa. But monkeypox really didn't garner broad attention until the outbreak spilled over into non-endemic countries this spring. Mm. And so it's definitely here. You know, as I mentioned at the top, you know, D.C. has a lot of cases. They've reported 122, but the director of health, Laquandra Nesbitt, she said, you know, it's likely more than that. So, you know, what should we be really looking out for? Yes, I think we, we all agree that the cases that have been identified are really the tip of the iceberg. So the infection is transmitted through close skin-to-skin contact. So what we should be looking out for is in ourselves is rashes that occur in places where rashes are unexpected. Many people's illness starts with a fever and lymph node enlargement, but not everybody has that presentation. Not everyone has a fever. Not everyone has swollen glands. And some people just have develop a rash and the rash can be a single blister or a single pustule in the very often in the genital area, but not always there. And some people have proctitis or rectal pain. These rashes um, and fevers and swollen glands occur within 21 days of exposure to a person who has monkeypox. Exposure means close skin to skin contact with um, a, an uncovered monkeypox rash or respiratory droplet contact. Um, and again, with a person who has monkeypox. And, you know, is this disease painful? How deadly is it? I mean, how dangerous are we talking here? The, the disease can be very painful and um, it can also be itchy, but pain is, is um, a more predominant symptom. It has not been deadly in this epidemic, the cases have generally been mild, um, again, except for pain. There have been, I think, maybe one or or two deaths in this epidemic around the world among the more than 13,000 cases identified, and, and no deaths in the United States. And let's talk about who's really at risk here. From the briefing from D.C. yesterday, it seems they're really targeting their vaccination campaign for a certain population. Can we talk about that? Absolutely. So the vast majority of cases have been identified in men um, because the infection has largely been spreading among men who have sex with men. So the cases, the, the folks who are being targeted for 
pre-exposure vaccination. That means vaccination of people who have not yet been exposed to monkeypox, but are at high risk for developing and being exposed to monkeypox infection are men who have multiple sexual partners. I think the district is doing exactly what they should be doing in uh, targeting that high-risk population. And so, doctor, in D.C., can literally anyone who wants one get a vaccine? I, I wish that there were greater availability of vaccines. In fact, even all the high-risk individuals who need vaccines uh, right now for pre-exposure prophylaxis cannot get vaccines yet. There is a national and an international shortage of these vaccines. They are being manufactured um, as quickly as possible, but um, there, there really aren't enough to control this epidemic as quickly as it needs to be controlled. And, you know, to understand viruses and disease for lay people who aren't in the medical field, sometimes it's helpful for comparison. So what's coming up in my mind, obviously, is COVID, but also the HIV AIDS um, epidemic. So how does monkeypox really compare to those two, just to kind of calibrate where we are? It's not really um, a fair comparison with COVID in, in several ways. So it's not a respiratory disease. Um, I will say that monkeypox is largely transmitted from by skin-to-skin contact, although respiratory droplets can transmit monkeypox because people can have oral lesions. So mask wearing is, is part of preventing transmission. I will also mention that it is not a sexually transmitted infection and condoms do not prevent transmission of monkeypox. It's again, it's transmitted through close skin to skin t- contact. That's the most important mode of transmission. Mm. So while you know it is a virus, it is kind of starkly different from coronavirus and HIV AIDS. Yes. The other thing is that monkeypox is not a a progressive illness like HIV. Monkeypox is an infection that people get. And when they get monkeypox infection, they don't transmit monkeypox before symptom onset. So that's another important thing. People are infectious from the time symptoms begin until the time the last scabs of their skin lesions fall off and new skin grows underneath. And then the infection generally takes about two to three weeks, has a two to three week course, and then they are cured and they're actually immune for life. So that is another big difference. Got it. And as we kind of close up here, what are treatment options? If you are part of that at-risk community, um, you know, what should you be doing now? If you get the virus, what should you do? People who are at high risk should, um, in the district, should pre-register for the vaccine. Um, The district is also vaccinating people who have been, um, had high risk exposures. Most people who have monkeypox infection recover without treatment, or they recover with treatment of their symptoms, which really is mainly pain medication. Um, Some people who have severe infection, like the severe proctitis or rectal infection, um, or eye infection, other infections of um, other severe local infections, can get access to tecoviramat. Their doctors can prescribe that. Um, It's an investigational antiviral that comes from the CDC and has been used now in a lot of patients. I've used it now in a number of patients myself with great outcomes um, and really improves symptoms very quickly. So have you treated monkeypox patients? I've treated a number of monkeypox patients um, myself and my infectious disease colleagues at George Washington University have too. Mm. We've we've seen a a great many patients there. Mm. You know, the first thing we we did was to, to figure out how to see them safely, how to bring them in and out of the facility safely um, and to avoid exposing other patients and to provide safe care uh, that was wouldn't, without exposing healthcare personnel. The DC Department of Health has made testing and um, treatment with this antiviral extremely easy. They have worked really hard to make those things possible from the very beginning. They work seven days a week to make this possible. Um, The public health lab in DC 
does testing every single day of the week. And then, you know, stigma is part of this conversation. We're talking about the LGBTQ plus community. We're talking about sex. We're talking about, you know, rectal pain. There's a lot of stigma here. So as a medical Mm -hmm. professional, for anyone who's either symptomatic, at risk, or who has family members that are, what role does stigma play and how do we, you know, beat it back to not make us less healthy? Thank you so much for that excellent question. The stigma is a huge barrier here. It's, it's, it's enormous. And it starts with the name. Monkeypox is a terrible name for this virus. It's a misnomer. It really has nothing to do with monkeys. It has to do with where the virus was first identified. And, and the name itself um, serves as, as an obstacle um, and, and is very offensive. So beginning with that, Yes, the stigma um, that is profoundly affecting the population that this infection is most um, targeting right now. And the folks who are presenting themselves for testing and care uh, are, again, the tip of the iceberg of who is actually infected with this virus. And I think the people who are um, showing up for care are those who are the least afraid of the healthcare system and um, are the most able to break through the stigma and other barriers. We have a lot of work to do to fight the stigma and stereotypes that are prevalent right now. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on the show to you know help us understand this virus and the stigma around it. Thank you so much for having me. And coming up, We hear from a D.C. resident who got vaccinated for monkeypox through D.C. Health just last week. He tells us why. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like the podcast, head to our show page, give us a rating, and leave a review. We read all of them and use the suggestions to improve this show that we're so proud of. It also helps other listeners find this, our region's only local daily news podcast. Thanks for making us a part of your day. The district has so far gotten 8,300 doses of monkeypox vaccines and given out 2,600 of them to D.C. residents. Alex Atkinson is one of them. He lives in the Wharf neighborhood and joins us now. Alex, thanks for being here. Hey, Luke. Thank you for having me. Of course. Tell us about this process. I'm sure you've been hearing about, you know, monkeypox in the news. Tell us about how you first heard about it, how you first received it, and then what led you to then, you know, get vaccinated. So I didn't really do a horrible amount of research into investigating whether or not I should get it. If there's a free vaccine, me personally, I'm just going to get it. So there was um, a friend of mine who I guess you could say is up to date on vaccine information suggested to me and a couple of my friends that we should get it. And I was like, okay. And then I just researched to see if the vaccine already existed or not. You know, and I was like, okay, this vaccine exists. Um, I was, yeah, check. So I was like, okay, sure. You know, and I read a little bit about the symptoms of monkeypox and I was like, that's looking pretty gnarly. I don't think I want to, you know, get that. I mean, in terms of why mostly people that are affected are young white gay men, I don't. No, I don't know why that is the case, but I mean, I think the the fact that I do identify as a member of the LGBTQ community helped me get the vaccination sooner because the Department of Health is prioritizing mm. those groups. But as far as why, I don't really know, and frankly, I don't. I don't want to say I don't care, but what I'm mostly concerned with is is getting the vaccine. Yesterday, Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt, <laughs> like the director of DC Health, you know, talked about like stigma really being a huge barrier here, a barrier between people and their best health outcomes. And just to be, I mean, Frank, you're coming on a podcast and talking about this. So it seems like stigma really, you were able to like cross that stigma. I mean, how'd you do that? I mean, it's kind of, I don't know, notable, I think. 
Well, I don't know. I think, um, I think through living through the pandemic, I'm going to choose to define two different paths that people sort of took with regard to sharing personal information about like health, um, exposure, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think there was a, there is a stigma or shame associated with contracting a disease, AKA COVID, right? And so, you know, people don't really know what's gonna happen or how people are going to react if, if it's known publicly that they're infected, you know? So I have experienced some people who I know, like they'll get COVID and then they won't really tell anyone about it. Like in the, <laughs> you know, yeah, no, or like, totally. <laughs> they, or like they're exposed, but they won't tell anyone. And I'm like, I don't think that that is a good practice. I don't think that that's, you know, in everyone's best interest, but I think that the reason why someone would behave that way is pretty understandable. Cause you know, I used to feel that way you know and i was afraid of what would happen but i when i contracted covid the first time yeah i mean i was just i was just very open about it i let everyone know that i had everyone know um who i had seen recently that i got covid like i put it on my instagram story you know so so yeah i think part of the reason why i'm so open about talking about monkeypox and getting vaccinated and all this personal information with you now on a podcast is because I had kind of gotten accustomed to, I guess, being open, talking about my vaccination status and views on whether or not I should get vaccinated and how many times I've got COVID and when was the last time I got tested, you know, with COVID. That's that. Yeah. And for anyone who's listening, who like maybe, you know, just struggles with that sort of stigma or that, I guess, stigma is the best word for it. How do you get over it? I mean, how, how do you deal with it? I mean, I don't know. I think that sharing information, obviously not all information, but being open about one's involvement or relation to an outbreak of a particular disease is, you know, to the benefit of everyone. So I may suggest considering that. Well, Alex, thanks for coming on the show and you know <laughs> telling your story. Seriously, um, we really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. And before we go, I might sound like a broken record to any of those listeners who heard yesterday's show, but I'm going to bring up Rock Creek Park just one more time. So Beach Drive is a road that runs through the spine of Rock Creek Park in the northern portion of D.C. And back when the pandemic hit, they closed it. They closed it to all cars and it was made a pedestrian only byway. And people, you know, largely liked the idea. Anyway, once the pandemic eased a bit and life got somewhat closer to normal, there's been a burgeoning debate over whether to open Beach Drive back up to cars. Now, this debate is happening between residents who have different, you know, desires for Beach Drive. But ultimately, the National Park Service is really going to decide what's going to happen. In the last few weeks, the National Park Service said that they're, you know, leaning towards the idea of closing Beach Drive totally to cars, only in the summer and then reopening it up to cars, you know, for the rest of the year. But it's not a final decision. And the National Park Service has been holding a number of meetings, listening to residents and their thoughts. But I want to know what you think. So you can call 844-282-1035 to let me know what you think. It's the WTOP Talk Back line. So again, you can call 844-282-1035 and then you're going to hit option three once you call that number and just yeah let me know what you think about this kind of beach drive debate and maybe you'll be part of a show that we do you know on this topic later on this week or this month anyway that does it for us on the dmv download our sponsor is Steamfitters local 602 Rosie Hughes helped produce today's show our managing editor is craig schwab and our music is by real world Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance and follow us on social media where we post content every day for all of you guys. You can find out more about this podcast and become one of our VIP listeners at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in DC, 1077 FM in Virginia, 1039 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at wtop.com and on the WTOP News app. See you tomorrow and have a good one.